Yo, peace. It's Kali Kala, man. I'm out here in Brixton in the UK for the release of my new film, Black Mother. Shout out to Dog Wolf. Yo, I'm just grateful to be in the Ritzy, man. I am a Ghana Akana Shanti. I'm a Jamaican. I'm a British. I'm a Jamaican Santa from Kingston. K I N G S T O N. Jamaicans can't spell. Let me finish. Because Kingston is K I N G S T O W N. I am a Jamaican. I am a Jamaican. I am a Ghana Akana Shanti from Kingston. Well, the story is like this Jamaica burst up in a tree pieces. Otherwise, we know that a tree county. And it was handed down to our ancestors. And the name of our ancestors was two brothers and one sister. And the name of them was Kojo, Nani, and Taku. And so comes you have the runaway slaves, the Maroons. The word Maroon means the runaway slave. The Jamaican government is not acknowledging the indigenous peoples of Jamaica's government. The Maroons signed a treaty with King George in 1738. You can't sign land treaty. Nowhere on this planet, international law allows anyone to sign land treaty more than 99 years. So when Britain signed a, a, a land treaty with uh, our Lord Sovereign eligible Kojo of the Nyonkopong Maroon Sovereign State in 1738, which is known law, the, the, the treaty ended in 1838. So Sam Sharp in Montego Bay was hanged in 1832 because Britain had told the plantation owners in Jamaica that they would have to play the slaves. The slaves in Jamaica could not read. Only Sam Sharp, who was a Baptist minister, who went to university in England. So they killed him in cold blood, and all Jamaicans knew. It's true. It's true. It's true. Black people have no right. edited, incredible. Um, so if you don't know Pete's work, he's a New York born and based filmmaker and photographer who has been described by the New Yorker as one of the most original filmmakers working today. This is our second feature film and the follow up to his highly acclaimed Field Niggers, which told the story of one of the last non-gentrified street corners in Harlem, East 124th Street and Lexington Avenue. Um, he's also a well-known documentary filmmaker created a documentary um, about Wu-Tang Klang, and then also worked as a cinematographer on Beyonce's Lemonade. Um, and you published your own book, um, Souls Against the Concrete. Hala is known for consistently maintaining an artistic integrity without compromise. Thank you so much for joining us here in Brixton. How is it? Quite a few Jamaicans around here. Do you feel at home? Definitely. <laughs> glad, to be, glad to be over here, man. It's a blessing. So um, tell me a bit about this. So this is a personal explanation of Jamaica. Some of your family members are even in this as well. How did you feel putting it out there, getting it right? Um, well, as you said, I did some commercial projects. You know, I worked on Beyonce's Lemonade. I did a bunch of different stuff, which was kind of just for money, you know. And this project was from the chest. This was a passion project, you know. It wasn't, it wasn't about money or nothing. It was just I had the opportunity, you know, to make a film based off of the success of my first film. There were people that wanted to give me money, you know, to, to produce a new project. And, you know, this is what I chose to do, you know. In the future, I will do some commercial work, some fake work just for money, you know what I mean? Of course, but this, this right here was definitely from the heart, you know. <clears throat> and the film uh, it starts with quite a lot of kind of hardship, talk of rape, prostitution, destitution, violence. Um, you know, you're really connected to that culture, you're part of that culture. Was that quite difficult? How did you feel about that, starting with that? Well, the thing is, you know, Jamaica is portrayed as this paradise in the Caribbean, you know what I mean? But Jamaica got a lot of problems, a lot of issues, you know. Um, it's been colonized, you know what I'm saying, by where we at now, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, by, by the British. So in that way, it's been raped, you know what I'm saying? And um, as a country now, all of the money is based off of service, you know, tourism. So it's like almost selling itself out like a prostitute would have to. You know what I mean? It sounds crazy to say that, it's harsh, but that's through the lens of history what has happened, you know what I mean? But me, you know, my mother's Jamaican. I, I just got my Jamaican citizenship, you know what I'm saying, as I was telling you earlier, you know, but I don't look Jamaican. You know what I mean? So filming this was just a matter of just speaking to people and letting them know where I was coming from or who I was, you know. Um, but I don't want to make it all pretty, you know what I mean? Like here you have the sacred and the profane married side by side, 
You know what I'm saying? I didn't want to just show the beautiful stuff and leave out the other stuff, you know? I just want to talk a bit more about that because I feel like you're really great at playing on different kind of, you know, concepts of history, what people think they know. Uh, you know, you said before about the reggae, weed, rusters, you know, reggae, you know, so many documentaries are about that. You know, that's all great, but that's not exactly what Jamaica yeah. is. Um, and you, know, you said you really wanted to create, and I think you've really successfully done it, a kind of 360 picture of Jamaica. Can you tell me a bit more about this? Definitely. Like, you know, this film was broken into three trimesters. And, you know, the first trimester is more what you would expect from Jamaica. Some of those tropes of marijuana, you know, people dancing in the street, you know what I'm saying? Or just food, you know what I'm saying? Those are the basic things on the surface level. But by the second trimester, it's a level deeper. Now we're talking about, you know, bleaching and more of the effects of colonialism, colorism, you know what I'm saying? These type of things. And then by the third trimester, it's in that real spiritual dimension that I wanted to get to from the beginning, but I couldn't have just went there from the beginning. It needed some exposition, you know, um, with all of the other stuff, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, th that was the idea, to make it progressively deeper. And there was like a kind of fourth trimester as well, wasn't the there? The birth, right. Yeah, the birth. Can you talk a bit more about that? I love the kind of use of water in that, and as we saw at the end, um, I'm sure it took your breath away as it did with me, and actually, the more you watch it, and I definitely recommend you all watch it again, it's out on Friday, um, it, you, could give, you really get, you see such new things when, whenever you look at it. Can you tell me a bit more about that? I think you've talked about it, you kind of compared it to the heart, haven't you, the different chambers? Definitely, definitely, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, in my mind, you know, I mean, I grew up studying metaphysics and, you know, I never went to film school, you know what I'm saying? Like, for me, I used to think filmmaking was boring, photography is boring, you know what I'm saying? But now, having a reason and a purpose behind it gives it more reason, more meaning to, to, to do it so it becomes more interesting. So, you know, my spirituality definitely led me throughout the whole thing, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, it's, it's three trimesters and then it's that fourth part, which is like, four chambers of the heart, you know what I mean? And as I said, this came from the chest. This was that type of project. So everything, all of my decisions were feeling based, like what felt good, you know what I'm saying? As you could tell, the audio and the video were completely separate. So making the decision as to like, put this picture with this piece of audio was just a matter of what felt right, you know what I mean? None of this was, was scripted. It wasn't written, you know? But yeah, I mean, the title was Black Mother, but it's from a son's perspective. And obviously I'm a man, it's from, it's from a man's perspective. You know what I mean? The title Black Mother wasn't supposed to be any definitive statement on the black woman itself. Although there are many statements in the film, but you know, you could have a million films on Jamaica and they'll all be different. You know what I mean? I made this one based off of my experiences going to Jamaica all my life since a baby. You know what I'm saying? Back and forth. It's interesting you talk about it wasn't scripted and stuff, because I really wonder how you got it put it together. There's so many different voices, um, you know, your family are in there, um, you know, you traveled around the, the, the island to gather these stories. Um, how did you go about doing that, getting it all together? Well, I mean, it took three years, really, of actual filming, uh, but some of the footage goes back to when I was younger, just going to Jamaica to go check my grandpops and, you know, built with him in the, in the mountains, and I was having a little high eight camera. So I leaned on some of that material even when I was making this. But, you know, many people are suspicious. Like, you know, they see you with a Bolex, and it's like, yo, what are you doing, man? Like, you know what I'm saying? Or Jamaica is so poor, you coming through with a big, expensive camera, everybody wants, wants to be paid, you know what I mean? But I'm gonna keep it real. Like, I blessed a lot of my subjects with money. You know what I mean? A lot of documentary artists, they say, once you pay your subjects, it's no longer authentic. You know what I'm saying? They're acting now or whatever. But it wasn't like that. Like, I'm dealing with so many people that are just living the street life. I got to hit them. Yeah. yeah, I got to give them something. You know what I mean? Especially coming through with a Bolex that looks like an antique. You know what I mean? <laughs> but when you see the finished film, it makes it look like it could have been easy. But a lot of people said no. You know what I mean? I would ask for permission and i say, no, nah, I don't want to be in your project or whatever. So, you know, it was just about, about persistence, you know? And um, whoever ended up in the film was supposed to be there, I feel. And it's kind of beautifully blended in it, isn't it, with the kind of out of sync audio and the portraiture, as well as the moving image, and then, you know, the drone, as I said, with the water. So vivid. Um, I really want to talk about water. 
um, I thought was really beautiful. There was the bit where you had the young girl talking about the water and how it's almost like a meal in itself, how nourishing it is. It's good for meditation. And then again, at the end that we talked about, tell me about the water and what that signifies for you. I mean, it ties into the title definitely because even with that title, Black Mother, it represents the land, it represents the food, the earth, the soil, you know what I mean? Um, all of that, the water itself is like the blood, you know? So the water was a common thread throughout the whole film that tied everything together. And I really ramped up the water around the funeral, you know what I'm saying? Because I don't believe in death, you know what I'm saying? Like spiritually, I look, I, I'm an eternalist, you know what I mean? So just like water changes from solid to liquid to gas, you know what I mean? Um, that's the, that's a, a beautiful metaphor for, for our existence too, transitioning. You know what I mean? Right now we're in the ice state, state, the solid state, you know what I'm saying? Death may be looked at like the gaseous state, you know what I mean? Or You know what I mean? So this wasn't supposed to be the Lion King or nothing with the circle of life, you know what I mean? But definitely it ties into the birth too for obvious reasons of a woman's water breaking. So was water, when you started the project three years ago, did you know that water was going to be such a focus? Or again, you said it was kind of feeling, how does it work between the kind of planning and the uh, not detailed scripting, but having a rough idea and then sort of going with it? Was that quite difficult? Well, it came about through an open mind, you know, because I would go and I would just film stuff and then I would listen back to the audio that I recorded or I would look at some of the video that I shot and then that would kind of give me some direction. You know what I'm saying? I would start editing. I was editing as I was shooting. You know what I'm saying? So I would look at what I was doing and say, oh, this would be good here. If I go and I put this there, you know, let me go back and film this. Oh, I'm missing a shot of this. Let me go and get that. So that's, that's how it came about, you know? It's interesting to hear that about the editing because anyone who works in film or audio will know that especially if you're doing something that's close to you which is a completely takes it onto a new kind of level editing can sometimes be quite painful there's so many things that you have to cut out but then also you're so close to the project and then half the time you're losing your mind tell me about the editing process how long did that take was that a nightmare um the editing was just continuous you know what i'm saying i would say probably like two years because i edited the audio first you know, that's where I found the structure and, and the pacing just in the audio itself through the interviews, you know. And um, it took a long time because I started, I had six hours of testimonies from people. So I was trying to like chisel six hours into a 77 minute film. And the way that that became easier was when I said, okay, I'm going to film a birth. And then when I decided to film a birth, I said, okay, I could chapter the film. Instead of chapters, it'll just be trimesters. And then it will be like a beginning, middle, and end, you know? And then I said to myself, okay, this type of stuff I should put at the beginning. This should go at the, at the middle. This should go at the end, you know? Some people were telling me to put the funeral in the beginning, you know what I mean? Or, you know, put the birth in the beginning, start out with the birth, and, you know, but I just went with what felt right, you know what I'm saying? I love the editing process. That's why I'm asking you another question. Well, I love and hate it. Um, is there anything that you got rid of that you wished you kept in? Or is there something that you could tell us that, oh, this I couldn't keep in, that was quite cool? Well, I mean, about the editing, as you could tell, there's no music. There's not a lot of music in the film, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, the film is edited to be musical. You know, it's not supposed to, when you finish the film, to be feeling like, oh, I missed music in the film. You know what I mean? Because the whole pacing is kind of like a music video. You know what I'm saying? The way things are, are matched together. Um, but, yeah, man, it was difficult because I had so much material and so much good stuff. I had to part with it. I had to cut away a lot of stuff, you know. My grandfather uh, related so many deep things to me. I wanted to be in the film, but I didn't want it to just become just about him, you know what I'm saying? And the parts that I included with my family were more universal that could relate to all families, you know what I'm saying? I didn't want to, you know, even say, yo, this person was born in this town on this date. You know what I mean? There's no like um, significance to the places. You don't see titles and texts coming up saying, okay, this is this Kingston, this is Montego Bay, you know? Cause this is just supposed to be like a, um, what do you call it? Like a, a collage, you know what I'm saying? And I use different formats, different cameras to pull out different textures, you know what I mean? And it's a feeling, like I wanted people just to feel like they went to Jamaica. You know what I'm saying? Certain people that are from Jamaica, they see this, they'd be like, ah, okay. You know what I mean? Like, I went home. Certain people that never been there, it'd be like, oh, shit, I feel like I've been to Jamaica for the first time now. 
you know. How was it filming your granddad? I love the bit where he's outside the house and you've got that shot of him outside his house, the kind of red house. And also, I love his DIY eye mask. Is that a DIY eye mask? I love yeah. it. <laughs> um, well, he lived on a mountain in um, a place called K Valley, you know, so it gets chilly up there at night. Even though it's Jamaica, the, the cold air from the gully comes up, you know what I mean? And, you know, so he would always wrap up. Um, but like it wasn't hard for me. Like the way that my grandpa's passed away, he was 96. He died in his sleep. You know what I'm saying? It was a beautiful transition. You know, growing up in New York, I, I have a lot of friends that, you know, one of my good friends just the other week just got stabbed to death in Harlem. You know what I mean? And he was only 35. So to see somebody like my grandpa's live into his 90s and then just pass away peacefully. So filming it, it wasn't emotional, like negative emotions, like, you know what I mean? Or, or like a loss. It felt like, okay, this is easy, you know what I mean? Plus, like, even in the editing, I felt like the presence of my grandparents with me, you know what I mean? And for me, it was like, okay, how am I going to pair, you know, all of this rugged, you know, street life, hard gutter material with, you know, something that my mother is in. My mother's in the film, you know what I mean? Um, but it just came about naturally. Like I said, it's the profane and the sacred together without judgment. And I really love the kind of um, the narrative, the, the kind of people speaking and the kind of religious hymns throughout, sung or recited by children or family members. It really kind of captured, I think, the musicality and the lyricism, I think, it's kind of really prevalent and massive, I think, in Jamaican culture. It's really honest and raw as well. Tell me about that, including all of that, people kind of speaking, praying. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. Tell me a bit about that. Well, I mean, I, I don't really see God in films. You know what I mean? If you ever see God in a movie, it's like a horror movie. And it's in some demonic way. Like, God doesn't have a good name in cinema. It's like some scary way or some way to make people feel guilty. Like, you're going to hell. You know what I mean? So I was just trying to, like, bring about the good news, man. Like, really to show God in, like, a positive light and a truer light than, you know what I'm saying, all of the, the lies about God and even religion. Like, this is, a, you know, a Christian. You know what I'm saying? But it relates to Muslims, it relates to the Catholics. Anybody I felt would be able to come to this film and get something from it, you know what I mean, spiritually. Because to me, I was going beyond the religion, you know what I mean? You gotta remember, like, the Jamaicans were given Christianity as a device to make them more docile during slavery. Certain passages of the Bible, like servant must obey your master and all these different type of things, were taught. Um, some um, but yeah, I mean, I just felt it necessary, man, you know, especially during the election, you got Donald Trump elected in my country, I was like, yo, we need to be praying, we need to come with a prayer, but a real prayer, not just like, I'm gonna pray and, you know, have food on my table, but you gotta pray and work, you know what I'm saying, so. Do you think there's... Um, do you feel that there's a massive difference in terms of the kind of um, the, sort of the black community uh, and how they celebrate and you know connect to churches in the Jamaica, New York, where you're from? Did you notice? Well, yeah, the Jamaicans you, rather than New York. I would say, from my experience, you know, it's more uh, a rational thought, like the approach to religion. It's not really just hooping and hollering and falling on the ground and rolling on the floor, kind of like you see in the American South. Not to say there's anything wrong with that. But from my, my family and looking at, you know, you know, my grandfather was a deacon, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, just growing up, you know, going to Jamaica, going to the church in Jamaica, it always seemed practical. It wasn't ever like, you know, uh, we're just going to pray and everything's going to be good. But these were hardworking people, you know what I'm saying? Not to say, you know, uh, people in the American South aren't, but it's just a different approach, you know? great guy actually he's weaved in and out of it and he talks about it being connected to class and business um were you struck again you'd always gone there quite a lot on and off as a kid but were you really struck by the religiosity after doing this project were you surprised that it was even more so what were your thoughts after intensely kind of documenting your culture well i knew it was i knew it was there you know what i'm saying because of my family and that's the reason why i wanted to, to put it on the forefront on the spotlight like that because when you hear about jamaica you're not really hearing about you know the deep spirituality of the people you're hearing more about 
the beautiful land or come there to visit or, you know, marijuana or Bob Marley or whatever, whatever, you know what I'm saying? So the Jamaican people are naturally spiritual. So it doesn't matter if they were given Islam or Judaism or Catholicism, you know what I mean? They, you know, the container doesn't matter. I look at religion like the water companies, you know what I'm saying? You, you got Poland Spring, you got the Sani, Fiji, Aquafina, um, Avion, all these different water companies, but they, they all contain the same thing. So the same thing with the religions, you know what I'm saying? They're all these different uh, uh, packagings, but they contain the same thing. So if you could find a pure spring of water in your backyard, which is pure spirituality, just drink from that. It don't gotta be put into a container. So Jamaican people, you know, just got a natural spiritual, you know, and yeah, and also you'll find with um, Jamaicans as well, a lot of the time the churches will be, again, like very spiritual, which, you know, many people connect to West African traditions and things like that. Do were you tell me a bit about that? Were you interested in getting some of that out there as well? Because I find when you're there, you know, people really talk about that and it de definitely feels quite different. Um. Well, yeah, it was definitely about, you know, the roots, you know what I'm saying? Because J Jamaicans are mostly taken from Ghana. You know what I mean? Um, you know, during triangular trade, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, who knows what type of practices they were doing in Ghana before. So this is just like a mirror. This film was like a historical mirror. You know what I mean? And people have been asking me, have I screened it in Jamaica? Not yet, but I don't expect every Jamaican to, to like this film. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, I will tell you, I screened the film in New York. You know what I'm saying? At Lincoln Center, and there, were, there was a big Jamaican population there and they straight talk throughout the whole movie you know what I mean so I, I didn't know if they liked it or not yeah yeah but like not even to do it in a hospital you know what i'm saying this is the way it, it happened you know but i'm glad it happened this way because it points at a lot of things you know what i'm saying like they thought i was the father you know what i'm saying like um i remember asking the doctor like how long it takes for a baby to be born and he was like have you been exercising the passage you know meaning have i been having sex with her do you know what i'm saying they thought i was the father so unfortunately a lot of the, the, the women are single mothers now, you know what I'm saying? Like the old culture, if you notice, the film is a throwback and a modern day. You hear my grandfather relating how he met my grandmother and how that happened. And then you see how a young man gets a girl's number in the street nowadays. Like it's a big difference. So I think that it just happened the way that it was supposed to happen for my film. Again, it's not any definitive statement on the black mother that this is it, this is the way it is, you know what I mean? But a lot of the times in the city, especially, women are given birth in a hospital like this. But it also has to do with the way I filmed the birth, obviously, because this was a private hospital. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't have filmed in a public hospital because usually in Jamaica, the public hospitals are like 12 women in a circle on 12 different beds to one nurse, one doctor. You know what I mean? And in order to film that, I would have needed permission from all of these other people in the public hospital. So I had to actually take a Sheikha, who was the niece of the young man who was negotiating with the prostitutes early on in the film. It's actually his niece, um, and you know, get a get a private hospital and a private doctor. You know, and it just happened to be a man. And you know, the way that it came off, he's just like hardcore with it. He's like push, push. This is where babies die. You know what I mean? So it just points at the intensity. You know what I'm saying of the whole film and of Jamaica itself. You know what I mean? Nothing was soft. Nothing was. You know what I mean? There's soft elements to it, but it's also very hard at the same time, you know? 
Um, but it wasn't intended to be male dominant, you know what I mean? Going back to what you said earlier about whether this was a scripted or a freestyle, about, you know, halfway through is when I decided, you know, that it was going to be with this focus on the woman like that. Um, but if you notice, it's probably like 60, 40 men to women speaking <laughs> throughout the film, you know what I mean? Um, in retrospect, I probably would have had it maybe 60, 40 women to men. But this is just kind of the way that it came about, you know what I mean? As a freestyle documentary. Um, but yeah, uh, the birth, I like it actually, the way that, the way that it, it came off. Because to me, it, it represents the, the reality. This is a documentary, you know what I mean? It's not something that I scripted, so. question actually because when I was watching it I was thinking oh, how'd you do that yeah, yeah. You... well that that place is a therapeutic place in St. Anne's Bay Jamaica and it's no oil no gas you know what I'm saying that's natural flammable water it's a spring coming out of the ground which has chemicals that are just naturally flammable so no oil no gas no pump um that's a natural place where people go for therapy and it was discovered like many 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 years ago you know the man's great grandmother the man that runs it his name is kevin it's a therapy people come there for therapy you know um but his great grandmother was trying to kill a wasp nest and she lit it on fire and it fell into the water and the, and the whole water lit up on fire and she ran and told her parents that there were duppies ghosts in the water you know and then her parents t told her like no that's a therapy that's where our ancestors used to go for their healing so, you know, that place is actually in the town where Marcus Garvey is from, you know, in St. Anne's Bay. So I wanted to include that, you know, because um, it represents the marriage of the spirit and earth. You know what I mean? Fire representing spirit and water representing the earth and them together, you know, and that's really what the whole film was, you know. So I kept coming back to that, yeah. Can I just go back to that as well? So you said it's kind of known for a place where people go for therapy. Is it a place where loads and loads of people from all over the island will go there? Or is it like a, a kind of secret-ish? Well, you've got kind of... people in Jamaica that have never even been there. They don't even know, know about it. You know what I'm saying? I've spoken to certain people in other parishes and said, yo, have you been to St. Anne Firewater? They said, no, nah, I don't know what that is. And I put them onto it. You know what I mean? So, but you got people coming from all over the world, from Italy, you know what I'm saying, from all over Europe going there you know, checking it out. It's on the internet, you know what I'm saying, if you were to Google it, but it's still pretty unknown. It's still like an unknown spot. Um, any other questions? I know, that good. Impact as far as like what was captured in the movie or at impact afterwards? Like, oh, well, the interactions, man, were all about trying to be intimate, trying to capture intimacy and the real, the real stuff. So I was telling people, like, you know, tell me the real. Tell me, tell me about your struggle. Tell me about the government. You know what I'm saying? Talk about the struggles. Don't just, just, just smile and, and tell me the good stuff. Like, you know, but, you know, it took time to get people to open up, to be intimate. You know, sometimes you come through with a camera and you may have to go through a few interviews before you get to the part where somebody said something that's like a testimony or something that's real that you'll want to incorporate, you know. Um, but I've been doing this for a while, so I've learned how to disarm people and to make people comfortable, you know. And um, even when I'm taking their portrait, right, I'll just say think about something profound, think about something deep that happened to you in your childhood or at some point in your life, some struggle you went through or something beautiful you went through, and just hold that in your mind. And don't talk about it, but I'm just gonna take your picture and project that, think about that. And I think that makes, you know, I capture that energy. You know what I'm saying? Like, somebody could be thinking about something, it's just pouring through their eyes, it's coming through their face, you know? This whole film is portraits. You know what I'm saying? I'm a photographer, so this is a photographer's documentary. You know what I mean? And especially with the audio and the video being separate, it, it creates uh, an invitation for the audience to come in 
and find meaning between the association of the, of the video and what they're hearing. You know what I'm saying? So it's like a book. When you read a novel, you depend on your, your third eye to put pictures to the words, you know what I'm saying, that you're reading. Same thing here, although it's very visual, it's that separation between the audio and the video which makes you, you know, fill in the blanks a little bit and participate differently, you know what I'm saying? So I'm asking a lot for my audience with this film too. That's why I said in the intro, it's okay to drift away because the film is so dense. You know, to me, it's like a plate of food. When you go to Jamaica and they give you a plate of food, there's a lot of food on that plate. <laughs> they filled out that plate properly for you, so. Everyone knows the best cultures. Give everyone loads of food. Yes, yes, yes. And that's how I made the film, like a serving of food. You don't got to eat it all. You know what I mean? You may not like all of it. There's so much in the film that you may just like these aspects of it, but these aspects, you know what I mean? But for me, it was important to include 360 positive, negative, neutral, you know, and try to depict it honestly, you know? Great. Hi. Yeah, last question. I think it's through through counting your blessings, like the song in the film, and through appreciating even a glass of water. You know what I'm saying? Like water is, you know, your brain is 90% water. Your heart is 70% water. You know what I'm saying? Water is everything. You know what I'm saying? Like people don't drink enough water. You know, so it's not necessarily about worshiping the water, but it's about appreciating the water and respecting the water and taking care of your health. Like a lot of the film has to do even with health. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, thank God, like, when the baby was born, it was born healthy. You know what I'm saying? There, there wasn't any complications in this birth. I was filming something that could have went any way. She could have had a, 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 a stillbirth or something like that. I was already there filming. It just came out to be the way it was supposed to be healthy, you know. And I attribute that to prayers. You know, she was praying a lot. She was a very, you know, spiritually attuned person. I would say regardless to where you live, it's important to have some sort of foundation spiritually because that's what's lacking. Like a lot of us are starving or we're dehydrated spiritually nowadays. And that has to do too with a lot of our relationships. Like our relationships are just between people, like horizontal from one person to another. So people will get distracted from their vertical relationship with, with the heavens, with God, with the universe, because there's so much into their relationship with their boyfriend, their girlfriend, or their mother, their father, their siblings, or just other people on the earth plane. You know, so people don't even know about their real relationship with the universe, which if that's in check, then they feel fulfilled. They're not feeling lack because, you know, everything in this world is about scarcity, lack. You know, that's why there's so much competition, because, you know, if you have, I don't have. You know what I'm saying? If I have, you don't have. So therefore, we got to compete. And my interests are separate from yours. Your interests are separate from mine. But if people deal with their vertical relationship, then they'll start to see, like, yo, this person is my brother or my sister. Like, their interest is just as important as my interest. In fact, that that's my safety to make sure that they have what they need to have. So, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to have what I need to have that way. Because the thinking of the world is backwards. The thinking of the world is, like, if I give something away, it's gone. You know what I mean? But in reality, to give and to receive is the same thing. Because that's you're always giving to yourself. I may have just met you, but I see myself. You know what I mean? We get confused because of the physical body, which is the template of the ego. So my ego makes me seem separate from you. You know what I mean? But that's just an illusion. You know what I mean? It's, no, it's a total illusion. So I would say like those type of perspectives are more healing and will change the world eventually. So just, I really want to ask one really quick question. Tell me what's next. So obviously this is out in the UK on Friday. Great. Um, what are you up to? After. Yo, I'm taking a break. I'm sitting back, smoking some blunts, <laughs> taking some mushrooms, some LSD maybe, sleeping, getting my sleep life back, you know what I mean? Eating good, trying to just chill and then come back with another film. 
you know, this is my second film. It took a lot out because the first film, if your first film is received well, there's pressure, there's expectations now for your sophomore project. And for this, there was a lot of expectations, you know what I mean? Uh, so I'm gonna write something now. I'm not gonna do another documentary. I wanna write a script and do something which is fully scripted, different, shoot it differently, work with a crew. Here, it's just myself and my little brother. Now I wanna get like a 10 man, 20 man crew. You know what I'm saying? Men and women crew, you understand? And do it properly, you know what I'm saying? And I'm 33 years old, like I feel like a baby in filmmaking still. I know Larry Clark, who made Kids, was 52 when he made Kids, you know what I'm saying? Kurosawa, my favorite film director, this guy made 30 films. He started when he was around my age. So, I, I, you know, people come to me, yo, I loved your film, yo, you're a master. Yo, I'm just a baby, man. I'm just beginning. 